Hello, and we are live. Welcome to the Bloodstream. I've got a couple of really cool guests tonight to talk about one of my all-time favorite 80s slasher movies. But before I bring on tonight's guests, I want to do some shout outs here. And also mention that um, if you have a question for either of my guests tonight, uh, either um, hold on to those. We'll, we'll, we'll try and do a Q&A session toward the end of tonight's stream. So uh, either hold on to those until then, or you can always send them via Super Chat. YouTube keeps a log of those, so they'll be easily accessible as we go along. Um, or I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat and uh, see if I can uh, keep up with uh, the question. So if you have a question for either of my guests tonight, uh, we'll hopefully do a, uh, a Q&A toward the end of tonight's stream. <clears throat> also, if you are a patron or a channel member, I have shared the link to join the stream if you want to actually jump on and ask uh, ask my guests a, a question face-to-face, -face, so to speak. That link is available for patrons and channel members. So a couple of shout outs here before I bring on my guests. We've got Christopher Stevens in the chat, Sugar Ray Ray, Flip Searles, Alex Bacon, Dylan. We got Dave. We got Usu, Richard Skarinki, Saturn Video, Sam Thomason, Heath Denson, Sean Sr., Bryce Bourne. Robert Long, and Tonus. Yeah, I hope everybody's doing well tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on tonight's guests. <clears throat> he is the director of My Bloody Valentine. One of my favorite 80 slashers. I'm sure it's many of your all's, one of your favorite slashers as well. George Mahulka. How are you doing tonight, sir? Really well, thanks. And how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to to come on the channel and talk about uh, my bloody Valentine. A pleasure. Well, I appreciate it very, very much. Been a fan of yours for a very long time, so this is really cool. Thank you. Also, also joining me tonight is the author of the upcoming My Bloody Valentine novelization coming to us live from the Hanniger mine Armando Munoz how's it going man hey guys good to see you thanks good for having to, me good to see you we'll, we'll keep an eye out on the mine shaft there behind you in case we see Harry coming we'll let you know <laughs> so. yeah please keep me posted <laughs> I'll warn there. you <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let you know but yeah uh, thank you both for coming on the channel tonight and talking about uh, my bloody valentine the novelization and you know where it all could go from here yeah this will be a lot of fun so let's go back to valentine bluffs and hannah germine i love my bloody valentine it's one of my favorite 80 slashers there's something special about the movie because it's it's about adults with adult problems blue collar folks in a gritty blue collar town you know not not teenagers and you know uh oh, broken hearts and you know uh oh, high school sucks kind of deal um the characters are memorable the kills are great at least in the unrated cut of the film and it didn't get sequels which i think kind of preserves those special qualities but what i what i think is interesting about you being involved in my bloody valentine george is prior to my bloody valentine your only other directing credit was for a comedy that's correct how do you go from a comedy to directing a bloody gory slasher flick well that's that's quite the interesting story um I made that little comedy and um, it turned out to be quite successful. Uh, worldwide sales. Um, it had a major, major run in, um, in drive-ins at the time, all over, all over the United States and Canada. And I was approached by John Dunning from Cinepix, the guys that did uh, Rabbit and Shivers, 
with Cronenberg. Um, they did um, um, Meatballs with uh, Ivan Reitman. Um, and John was always looking for young directors who could make him money. And um, so he hired me to do a, um, a comedy. He actually gave me a two picture deal. And, um, you know, and it was two pictures that I was going to develop for him and, and direct for him. And the first picture he wanted me to do was a comedy. I had a lot of connections with at the time with the people at the National Lampoon magazine. And um, so we started writing a comedy. And um, we got to the point in the comedy where it was going very, very well. And then one of the head writers or the head writer of that, of that writing team um, ended up, shall we say, enjoying a little too much Peruvian marching powder. <laughs> and, and, um, and ended up writing an 800 page screenplay wow literally That's an epic. it was it, it was it was a telephone book that is an epic it, yeah and uh you know i mean i was young i had no idea you know what to do and uh, i just felt really bad and john said well look george you know um can we swear on this channel um oh sure what basically john said was <laughs> I'm not going to be able to read this fucking script before we were supposed to finish shooting it, you know? <laughs> um, so, so he says, how would you like to do your second feet, second film first? And I said, sure. What, you know, I've got no other ideas right now. And he gave me a one page treatment called the secret. And the secret was basically the one page treatment for my bloody Valentine. Mm. To which I said to John, well, John, you know, a horror film. I've never made a horror film in my life. And John said, well, you didn't make a comedy till you made one. So, so I said, well, I guess you're right on that. And, you know, I was young. I wanted to make a movie. I, I was up for making a movie that, that, that summer and fall. So I said, sure, let's do it. And he said, well, there's a couple of problems that go along with it, but, you know, I'm glad you want to do it. Uh, you know, this was sometime in July, I think. And he says, um, I've got paramount interest in it. They want to release it in 1200 theaters. They want to release it on February 13th, um, which was Friday the 13th that year. Um, and so we got to shoot this, edit it, get it all together and get it out into the theaters for February 13th, which meant in those days that it had to actually be finished for early January because doing 1200 prints and shipping 1200 prints in those huge, big, heavy cans and things took months or at least weeks to do. So, so that's how we ended up doing it. So I, uh, we brought John Baird up from LA to write it. Um, I worked with John on a, a uh, on a story outline. Once John Dunning okayed the story outline, Bob Presner and I, the uh, the line producer, took off to Nova Scotia to start looking for locations, while John Baird, the writer, was writing the first draft of the screenplay. By the time we got back and found these locations. Um, John already had the first draft ready. We started casting. Um, you know, I, I came back with a bunch of ideas on what the mine looked like and what other kind of kills and what we could do there. We shifted and changed the sc screenplay to fit that. And then we went and we went to Nova Scotia in a little town called Sydney Mines, Nova Scotia, which is Valentine Bluffs. And uh, we shot the movie, um, you know, in a, in a mine, 900 meters underground. Yeah. You know, I know you, <laughs> yeah, I know you kilometers, you know, under the ocean. Um, yeah. I, so, I know you shot the film in a, in a real 
it was formerly an act uh, uh, in an active yeah it was it, it was shut down six months before we we shot in there and the locals were wanting to turn it into a museum so they kind of left everything as it was except one of the funny parts about this you know that that's an anecdote that i always said um we loved mine we loved everything about it we left to go back to montreal at the time to um report back what we found and um and work with the writer and finessing things and casting and we told everybody we'd be back in about three weeks to start you know to start prepping well these lovely people in uh, sydney mines nova scotia said we can't have a big movie being shot in this dirty filthy old mine of ours they went out and they painted the whole mine and made it look brand new <laughs> it looked like something straight out of a Walt Disney fable or yeah. fairy tale. Um, you know, so uh, when we came back, that was the biggest shock of ours. So we ended up having to hire every scenic artist in Montreal, Toronto, and whoever we could find in Nova Scotia who could hold a paintbrush and ended up having to repaint the mine to make it look like what it looked like when we first saw it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, what were, what were some of the other, I mean, I, I imagine shooting that far down in a real mine presented a lot of difficulties. I'm sure it was very cold. I'm sure it was just, you know, the air quality was bad. I'm sure they're, you know, you're lugging, you're having to lug all that gear up and down. And what, what were some of the, the issues that shooting in a real mine well, well, presented? You know, a couple of the issues, you know, the first issue was obviously they wanted us there, so they neglected to tell us that uh, we could only use um, uh, safety, you know, labor, labor, uh, labor union approved safety lights in the mine, which meant 25 watt bulbs. In those days, you know, I mean, uh, film stock was not that um, sensitive. So we ended up having to um we ended up actually using the same lenses that stanley kubrick used on um on uh, barry linden because we needed we needed some lenses that were so sensitive or so fast as we call them to be able to get some kind of light in we could only shoot with 25 watt bulbs or you know which generally in those days you know the smallest lights you'd use see on a film set would be like one kilowatt you know five kilowatt lamps 10 kilowatt lamps that's that was the standard in those days huge big barrels that were just blasting out heat and light and here we are with these little things you know um so uh that was a major issue actually funnily enough it gets warmer down there not colder it's cold up on top. The deeper you go down into the earth, to the earth's core, it gets warmer. Um, so it was kind of weird. Um, you know, every one of the th things about a mine is that coal mines is they're not black, they're white, they're gray. They're like a cadaver gray because they're covered in lime, lime dust, lime powder to prevent um, sparking. Mm -hmm. So, so we had that, that little problem of, uh, of, of worrying about sparking because there's another thing about coal mines, methane gas, methane gas tends to kill people mm -hmm. and tends to explode very easily with the least amount of, you know, uh, a spark from static electricity could start off an explosion in a, in a coal mine if the mm. methane gas is built up enough. And since we were shooting this in the late September, early October, and the weather was getting kind of bad, um, what's called low barometric pressure when the, when the atmosphere is very, very heavy with humidity and so on, the vents in the mine would get blocked up that would collect methane gas on, in, in the mine itself. So we got kicked out, I think three or four times 
for methane buildup where we were just told shut off all lights immediately and get get to the surface as fast as, as possible wow um you know the 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 real access to the mine was what you actually see in the movie those two elevators that go up and down with all the smoke and it looks like you know the elevator to help mm -hmm. well those were the actual elevators that we used to take to go down um uh, it would take uh about 15 minutes for a crew of 10 to go down so by the time we got all our crew down it was at least an hour after they were called to set Wow. And then we'd have to take them up an hour before lunch so that everyone would be up for lunch. Then the same thing on the way back down. So mm -hmm. um, it made shooting time a little shorter than we anticipated. You know, Were there any pressures? Had, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'm, oh, what were you saying? Oh, oh. I was going to ask, was there any pressure put on you by the producers or by, I know you said Paramount was involved. Were there any pressures put on you about, you know, get this thing done and why? Well, obviously, obviously, you know, the, you know, the producers, any producer at any time, you know, when, whenever you're making a film, you're going to get pressure. Mm. And the pressure is to deliver on, you know, deliver within the schedule that was prepared that the, the budget covers. So, <clears throat> I mean, luckily enough, the the line producer I was working with, Bob Presner, was a very, very smart and uh, experienced guy. So we 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 put this in for 35 days of shooting, which we needed every day. As a matter of fact, there were times when we were we ended up having to do second unit and third unit where I would finish shooting in the mine then go out and shoot a scene on the bluffs, uh, then take another shower and go out and shoot a couple of insert shots of what we needed, footsteps or whatever it was, then take an, have an hour's sleep and then go back and work in the mine again for 10 hours. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, I was young. I didn't need sleep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But they didn't, they didn't take into account that all this time that was spent just bringing people up and down, you know, the, the, no, nobody, the, nobody really foresaw any, nobody really foresaw, you know, and, and I'm including myself in that, you know, I mean, we were just so excited. We were so, uh, you know, blinded by the beauty and the, the macabre beauty of the mine and the potential of shooting in there and in doing all this crazy, wonderful stuff with Tom Berman's special effects, you know, the state of the art being able to do all these things that we thought we were going to do, you know, first time ever one shot, one shot, special effects, you know, worked out to a minute detail. So, you know, we were, we were just, you know, so excited about doing all those things that we, you know, we just said, well, this is it. We'll figure it out. We'll do it. Well, and speaking of those effects, I mean, I know you had a tremendous battle with the, MPAA at the time to get the film in R rating. Uh, do you think they were extra hard on you because you were a Canadian production or because Paramount was involved and they had had that huge hit the year prior with Friday the 13th? Um, do you think it was because it's, it's 1981 and there's a new slasher movie out every weekend or all of the above? I think it was a combination of many things. One of them was obviously, um, you know, uh, the fact that, um, we were Canadian, mm. um, the fact that Paramount was basically stuck, they, they had such an investment in to get this out for the 13th of February and the MPAA didn't bother looking at our cut until early January. Mm. Um, so, you know, they knew that they had, you know, I mean, let's be honest, they knew, I think they knew that they had Paramount by the balls to begin with. Uh, Jack Valenti was not a big fan of horror to begin with and was certainly not a big fan of Canadians. Uh, this was the time when, um, 
Canadian films were making major inroads in Hollywood. Meatballs, just a year before, ended up being the highest grossing comedy ever in the history of Hollywood. Um, I've heard quotes of Jack Valenti saying, just tell those Canadians to take their fucking movie and go home. This is it. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Um, so obviously we did not have the time. Paramount did not have the time. Uh, Cinepix, our company did not have the time to fight or negotiate much with the MPAA because it had to be out. The investments, the amount of money already gone into it was so great that they had to basically acquiesce to all of their demands in, you know, I still maintain that the MPAA's demands were way over any other film, you know, that's ever been, you know, shown to them. Mm. On top of which, there was one other problem, which acerbated, acerbated the issue a little more. John Lennon got shot early December mm. of the year before. And, you know, there was a major backlash against um, um, gratuitous violence, you know, which always happens, you know, I mean, it's, it's mm. just one of those things, you know, um, you know, I mean, if it's a school shooting, then it's the thoughts and prayers, you know, and, and God forbid that anybody will do that until the next one, you know, so in a sense, uh, that I think was used by the MPA also as a, uh, uh, as sort of a sledgehammer saying, nobody wants this stuff. Nobody wants this stuff. And, you know, yeah. and you know, and we all know Hollywood, you know, I mean, you know, uh, when John Belushi died of an overdose, nobody did drugs in Hollywood and it was horrible. Right. Up right. until, you know, up until, you know, somebody else went to Johnny Depp's club. You know, I mean, whatever, you know, um, yeah. so, so it's just one of those things. I think it was a, um, a, a, a how would you call that? You know, um, just a, a, a series of circumstances, every one of them against us. Mm. You know? well, how, yeah. how soul, how soul crushing was it? dealing with the MPAA and seeing, you know, entire sequences, uh, that, you know, so many people had worked so hard on have to be removed from the film. It was very soul crushing, you know, and especially because, because we designed them in a way that most of them were one shot effects. It was very difficult to cut around or to cut, to make it shorter or to cut, to make it less gory. You know, uh, you know, in most most films and even to this day, you know, you see the knife coming down in one shot. You see the knife entering in another shot. You see the knife coming out in the, in the previous shot. So there's always something you could do, you know. Uh, but when it's all in the same shot, when the pickaxe goes under here. And then the eyeball pops out at the same shot. Right you know, and the blood starts flowing everywhere mm -hmm. and that's the same shot. Well, how can you, how can you make that less gory? Right. Right. Yeah. So there's only one thing you can do either, you know, just cut here and then show the eyeball later, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but, but, you know, I mean, I got to the point where the, the, the cutting, I mean, what I say is we died the death of a thousand cuts. We had our editor in LA with a, uh, with a work print. We were in the mixing studio doing the final sound and cutting the final, cutting the negative. And the editor would say, they want you to take out 10 frames of this shot. So we already mixed and already cut that negative. So now we have to go and cut 10 more frames out. Then we had to go back to the master mixtapes and fix that part. Mm. Then he'd call again and say, oh, well, they want you to take another three frames out. Oh, well, they want you to take another five frames out. Because we'd send back, 
that version, you know, or he'd be showing him that version over there as he's cutting. So it got to the point where literally at one point they said, we want to take another five frames out. And I, I was on the phone with the editor saying, you know, and I know there are no more five frames. That's just a sound right now that they're objecting to, mm. you know, so which was one of the reasons why we could never really do a, uh, a, a director's cut of the full movie because everything got chopped into such little pieces. And in those days with a negative, once you cut negative, the two frames on either side of that cut are lost. You can't put it back together again. Hmm. So it's not like video where you could just cut out a bunch of frames and then go back to your original material and punch in the dump, you know, punch in the, the code again and get it back to where it was. So, so that, so uh, that unrated cut that came out on DVD many years ago, the special edition that, that reinstated like the, the pickaxe and we got to see the, the, right. the, the hot dog drowning scene. Right. There were still, there's still a lot of stuff that was left out. That's not the true uncut version. No, that, that, that is about, I would say that's about 65% of what we had in a lot of these things actually uh, could only have been done now because most of these things were not negative. They were, they were work print, old work print, scratched old work print that was found in a locker when Cinepix, Cinepix, the company Cinepix that I worked for at the time was finally sold to Lionsgate about, or, or basically Lionsgate, Cinepix became Lionsgate. And um, um, the warehouse, Cinepix warehouse in Montreal was being, you know, dismantled and, and, and stuff taken out and so on. And they found a locker with a bunch of rolls of work print, scratched old work print, that that uh, was part of the film that were cut out. So uh, what Shout Factory did, which was amazing, is they re-digitized and re-mastered re, um, those to make it work within it. But, you know, there's still a full scene of Mike and Harriet's death that's gone and will never be there ever again, aside from the novel. Mm. Are, are there any other uh, special effects sequences, kill sequences that that are just lost? Uh, well, basically, uh, Howard, when Howard's head separates from from his uh, from his neck when he when he gets dropped down into the mine shaft, mm -hmm. that's pretty well, you know, uh, just a little bit of what it was. Um, happy, Happy's kill is still not as 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 um as complete as it should be uh cynthia's kill on the shower head is still missing you know i mean that was a one shot of her head being smashed against that and then the water being turned on and water coming out of her mouth i mean it was just magic mm -hmm. seeing how these guys Tom Berman and those and his crew, how they did that stuff, you know? Mm, mm. So, so, I mean, I would say that, you know, right now the shout factory version is the closest we'll ever see to what the original would have been, mm. but it's still not completely. Right. And unfortunately, I don't think it'll ever be, you know, I don't mm. think there's any more footage anywhere. Um, I, like probably quite a few people watching this, first became aware of My Bloody Valentine either on VHS or via cable television. For me, it was USA Up All Night. Um, <laughs> Armando knows what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I fell in love with the movie immediately. Um, Armando, when did you first become aware of My Bloody Valentine? I would say I was aware of it when it was first released. Mm. which was, but I didn't see it first run. Uh, the movie came out two days before my ninth birthday. Mm. 
And I was so terrified by even the commercials of the film that there was no way I would venture to a theater. And the reason for this was the prior year, 1980, I by chance, the first horror film I ever saw in its entirety that I can recall was the original Friday the 13th, very first show in the cinema opening night. And I went with my babysitter. I was eight, and the thing traumatized me. It really absolutely traumatized me. I, When Jason popped out of the lake at the end, I threw my red vines and soda in the air, and I ran screaming down the middle aisle into the lobby and everybody laughed at me. <laughs> and I had nightmares for years and didn't see another horror film in the theater until Poltergeist in the summer of 82. Wow. But I was aware of its presence through uh, television ads and newspaper ads. And even those terrified me. Like because of what Friday the 13th was, nothing scared me more than theme day slasher films mm. and even more specific theme day slasher films with paramount logos in front of him yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, like right. i associated i could i was like oh that's dangerous that's like yeah again i just couldn't process it and so it took a few years before i finally be, did become an actual genre fan and that was that year was 1985 and it was right at the beginning of the year I started reading Fangoria and Stephen King, and I went out and rented all of the big titles. My Bloody Valentine was one of those early titles I had to see, that I was so eager to see. And again, it was one of those, like you said, you just fall for it immediately. And even in its you know, heavily censored R-rated form, it's a strong movie, mm. and it's a scary, atmospheric movie it really grabs you and it's still brutal without being gory and so it still felt frightening and threatening but i could enjoy it now i knew how to process that kind of thrill and so yes i was 85 was when i became a super fan of my bloody valentine it was just an immediate click mm -hmm. um and, you know, I can go back and now I love Friday the 13th. I think it's one of the greatest works of art there is, you know, so it's just interesting how you reprocess things as you uh, get older. Mm -hmm. But I think um, breaking down these films, the learning the mechanics of their creation through Fangoria and interviews and the ways that we had back then helped me learn to both appreciate it as art and then it's just where my my interests you know dovetailed like oh i'm gonna i want to have a career uh in the genre mm -hmm. as a kid though you know i thought oh it's the special effects i'm gonna be a special effects artist i'll be the next savini and uh, right, you know right. i order his book and dick smith's dick smith's book but you know it took money to buy makeup supplies and i didn't have it you know, growing up. And so, but writing, that was something that I was into even before 85. And, you know, I bought my first novelization in 83 and that was Return of the Jedi. Uh. And then 85, I was picking up the horror novelizations. So, you know, as they hit the shelves. And so writing really ended up kind of becoming the base, a base of where I wanted to be and learning story structure, reading screenplays, um, reading the books about, you know, of the movie was all very helpful. And, you know, giving me that, that teaching. Well, have you, did you hold on to any of those novelizations from the eighties? I have them all. Yeah. Well, okay. no, not, not all of them. A few of okay. them became lost over the years. I have no idea what happened to Jaws, the, the revenge, but uh, a That's few a of them one. like that. Oh, I used That's to ha I used to set it up on a special shelf because I liked the cover so much. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, they're all upstairs, or uh, I should say above ground. Once I'm out of um, the mine. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting that you bring up Jaws: The Revenge because the the novelization of the movie can sometimes differ greatly from the movie depending on what version of the screenplay the author had to work with. 
So like with Jaws the Revenge, he had an early draft that included, you know, the 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 the, the Papa voodoo guy and you know all this stuff that didn't make it into the movie for obvious reasons. But um yeah. Uh, that that's one thing I love about novelizations, and I, I've got quite a few from from the '80s myself, and some of them are pretty pricey these days. So. It's, it's incredible the amount of money that they go for. Oh yeah, oh, but yeah. mine are very well read, and even the ones that didn't quite hit the mark or satisfy, I would still read on you know a regular basis. Like, so I became very very familiar and very very much a fan of them in general. Well, well, let me ask you from fan to fan, mm-hmm. what is it about My Bloody Valentine that makes it special, that makes it stand out among the deluge of slashers from that era? I think it's um, a number of factors that work together. One of them is that brutality and atmosphere. It works. Mm-hmm. It's suspenseful. It's scary. And it sticks with you because of that. But I think its longevity has is more to do with the story and the characters. These people love these characters and, you know, I love them. And the whole story that they're, you know, involved in with this, it's unique, you know, it's a revenge tale, but it's presented um, within a formula we know, but still with enough distinct, visuals and atmosphere and dyna- character dynamics to me it, it just all works in a way mm-hmm. it's a this incredible cocktail and and these ingredients that it just all works so well together and i mm-hmm. think that's why the film had such a huge fan base before we got to see all that missing footage mm-hmm. you know we all loved it we all love you know to watch that love triangle and to hang out with Howard and happy and then that bar and all these characters we love. Like that's, I think a, a big part of it, uh, our appreciation. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I wish I had a moose head. I wish I had a moose head beer. I'd be drinking it right now, you know, <laughs> but I, I, sure I, I, you know, I would have brought some, <laughs> <laughs> but the characters are, are they're your different kind of slasher fodder characters a lot of the slashers of that era were teens and it was teen issues and you know these were adults these were blue collar you know working men and women and um you know the the love triangle works and the the atmosphere is tremendous and it's brilliantly directed brilliantly directed yeah brilliantly directed uh when did one more, one more thing I would add to that. Uh, what Valentine has, which most of the other slashers don't, most of the other slashers, we know who the killer is. Mm. It's somebody in a mask. It's somebody, you know, somebody with a with a chainsaw. It's somebody, you know. Um, but you know, we know. One of the things over here in, in, that we tried to do with this was it's also, in a way, a a weird murder mystery. You Mm -hmm. don't know who the killer is. You know, there's, you know, there's uh, a certain time where you think it might be Harry Warden. That gets pulled out really early in the movie when they realize that Harry Warden is no longer with us, you know. And then who can it be? And, And you don't really know who it is until the last scene, you know, and by that time you kind of guess that it's got to be one of those two guys or maybe somebody else, mm-hmm. which we haven't figured out yet, but, you know, so I think that helps it in, or that also helped it. I agree with everything that Armando was saying, you know, because that's exactly what we wanted to do was um, one of the funny things is when we were planning to make this film, while we were making the film, John Baird, myself, and Rodney Gibbons, the DOP, said, well, we want to make the deer hunter of horror films. Mm. And, you know, and it's funny because Tarantino just a few years ago said the same thing, you know. Uh, 
So I think that has a lot to do with it. And these characters are timeless. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, a teenage girl from the eighties is totally di different than a teenage girl from now, but a blue collar teenage girl or a blue collar 22 year old in some small town is pretty close to what they are right now too. You know, so I think that's what is one of the reasons why it resonates. The blue collar part resonates a great deal. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and both the, you know, when you, when it gets to that point where you're going, okay, so it's either, it's either what's one of these two guys, but there's also kind of, cause you don't want it to be either one. Cause they're both, they're both likable guys. You can sort of meet both of them, you know, halfway. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, and, and, and of course, you know, the ending is great, you know, be my bloody Valentine and ha ha ha. And you, the, he gets away. So, yeah. you know, whatever happened to him, where did he go? Did he ever come back? I don't know. Well, well, well uh, one at, day at, we might find out. <laughs> at what point, George, did you start to become aware of the fact that my bloody Valentine was, had garnered this, this cult like following? Um, uh, probably I would say, um, uh, early mid nineties. Um, you know, I was busy. I, uh, you know, when you mentioned, you know, a little bit heartbroken about all these things I was, and, um, uh, I decided for quite a while to retire from, um, genre filmmaking and went back to doing comedies and went back to a different culture. I started directing a great deal of movies in French hmm. and lived in France for quite a while and um, did French language comedies. And, and um, so I was a little bit out of the, the whole, um, I guess, milieu for quite a while. And then, I think it was mid nineties, early to mid nineties. And, um, I realized that, you know, all of a sudden bloody Valentine, people are talking about it. Then that fabulous Irish art punk band named themselves after the movie. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I started having young people talking to me and say, Oh my God, you did it. My bloody Valentine. You know? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so by the end of the nineties, um, you know, it was very, very, it became, you know, something where I was invited to, um, screenings. I went to LA, went to Chicago, New York, all over the place. And, you know, I mean, I think the first one was in Chicago and it filled this old, beautiful old theater. I think it was 1200 seat theater. And it filled it with people and people actually came to me and told me that they drove up from Alabama and from all over the place just to see the movie and hear me speak, you know, and, you know, and people wearing pickaxe earrings and, and, you know, and I just went, Oh my God, there's a phenomenon going on here that I was not even half aware of, you know, and, uh, it's, 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 it's just been amazing how it just keeps growing. You know I mean? Um, funnily enough, um, you know, the remake obviously brought a lot of young new fans to it because one of the interesting things about horror fans, they're cinephiles and they're not going to watch a remake until they see what the original was. So right. even the ones that never saw the original would want to see the original, you know, just to compare the two. And, um, uh, you know, and so the remake actually brought even more focus onto the, the original very positively, if I might add. And, um, uh, since then it's just been even bigger. Mm. So, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's lovely, you know, it's, it's lovely to know that after all these years, something that I've made has given so many people so much pleasure, you know, did you, you know, with all the cuts that you had to make, because uh, eventually, you know, I, I, it, it, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I mean, it kind of, 
when you have to cut so much and, and so much of your vision is, is altered, you, you kind of, uh, no longer be, take owner. It, it, like, like it's no longer your, you no longer feel as proprietary about it. Right. right. So, so you know. did you, did you go from maybe a place of, you know, that movie was not a great, experience or not a great memory to now you see all the all the people that it's touched and all the people who love it has that changed your well your i think i think yes a little bit you know i mean the the experience was great you know i have made lifetime friends with the people i made that movie with uh the cast or the the remaining cast that's still with us you know thank the lord you know we're still dear friends you know, we're in constant contact, you know, Helen Udy, Tom Kovacs, uh, you know, Bob Presner, the, the, the line producer, uh, Rob Stein, um, uh, Tom Merchantson, uh, Jim Merchantson, sorry, uh, Lori Hallier, Howard, uh, or Howie, uh, was, was one of our great friends. You know, he just passed away. You know, Alfie just passed away a little while ago. Um, you know, and so we're we're still very very close and and we've always you know we've always bonded over it and and bonded in a way also of, of regretting that none of us could ever see the movie the way we all intended it to so mm -hmm. there was a little bit of that you know it still worked for us and we still loved it but you know to me as 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 having put my heart and soul into it and try to make it as good as possible it was a, a major disappointment, shall we say, you know, and, and I would say for the first 10 years, I would, <laughs> as much as I loved hanging with the cast, you know, and Rodney Gibbons, the DOP is still a dear friend. I played golf with him two days ago, mm. you know, and had dinner, you know, um, so, um, so, um, you know, but, I think, you know, like I said, you know, I mean, after a while, the hurt kind of gone away. The the fact that people still love the movie or or actually started liking the movie or 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 I realized that they were liking the movie even more, no matter what the fact that it wasn't exactly the way I imagined it to be on screen, um, kind of wore away that that sort of disappointment. And now I just feel a great deal of pride, you know. That's great. I I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it, it was either in the late 90s or maybe the early 2000s, you you went to Paramount with an idea or or maybe a, a script for a sequel, and they um, weren't interested? Well, it, was, it was John Dunning uh, who approached me. He had a, he had a, a screenplay for a sequel that he wanted to do and uh i read it and i said okay john you know i mean i see where you're coming from i'd like to do a lot of changes in it but you know hey by mm -hmm. that time i was a well established and uh and i guess pretty accomplished director um you know so i said you know john i'm not, not going to shoot it word by word but yeah let's do it and uh, somehow or other I don't know what happened in terms of whether it was financing or something, but it didn't work out. Um, since then, I've been working on a uh, on a concept for a uh, a sequel, which Armando knows a little bit about, but I can't really talk about it right now. Um, but I've been working on a sequel concept which basically would bring back a, quite a few of the original cast and, uh, and would, would be shot in the same old town, the same, the same town that Valentine Bluss was shot in. Um, but with a new twist and, uh, and a very, very interesting new, new killer that would come out of it. But, um, you know, uh, but you know, and at the moment, you know, we were just, it's still baby steps. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if it ever happens, you know, mm -hmm. well, so fingers we, crossed. You know. Well, you know, yeah. 
let's put it this way. You know, I mean, if we can get all the fans out there saying, yes, 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 we want a sequel, want a sequel, and keep telling Lionsgate they want a sequel of the original, it might work out. Mm. Right now it's Lionsgate who's who's the gate the gatekeeper. Yeah. It's the lion's gatekeeper. You know. <laughs> the, uh, you, know you you so mentioned they, the you know, you mentioned the remake from 2009, which was a, a big hit. Uh, yeah. Did you did you see it? Yes, of course. What you know. what did you think? Well, you know, um, it's it's a it's that's always been you know what my my usual answer to that is very simple. Uh, you know, since film making has begun or since the film industry of which is now probably about a hundred, 110 years old, I guess, you know, uh, how many films have been made, you know, mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands, mm-hmm. how many have been remade? Not many, fewer, much fewer. I'll take that as a compliment then. <laughs> I, and it was, and again, it was a big hit at the box office. And yeah, I, I've had both. You know, I mean, the concept, you know, I know, I knew Patrick Lucier. He was, he was an editor on mm-hmm. one of the French television series that I was doing in France back in the eighties, the mid eighties. Uh, you know, he's a great guy. I think they did a, 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 a really great job. Um, you know, I mean, honestly, I wished I would have thought of 3D back back in 1981. <laughs> you know, what better way of using using a pickaxe than 3D, right? Exactly. Um, you know, um, I was a little confused about the 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 end of the story and what they what they did with it. You know, mm-hmm. honestly, uh, that that was that was a bit of a surprise to me on why they did that. Um, in uh, and why we needed an explanation after, hmm. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I've had, I've had both Patrick and the, the writer of the film, Todd Farmer. On yeah, Todd Farmer's a great guy too. I know Todd. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, it, um, yeah. The, you know, the, the funny thing is, even though that movie was such a success, um, there was no sequel. Uh, Lionsgate was not interested in a sequel. Yeah, I know. I know Lionsgate, Lionsgate is, 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 is very strange with that, you know, uh, yeah, you know, and any uh, every every other studio gloms on to any prospect or 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 idea of a remake or another sequel, you know. Because I know Todd is Todd was telling me, you know, that uh, you know, every couple of years they go and see Lionsgate, you know, and say, hey, you know, we made a lot of money for you guys. How about a how about a sequel? Yeah. Or how about yeah. a new idea on it? And they say. Thanks a lot. Great idea. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Goodness. I don't yeah. know. You know, it's ridiculous. it is what it is, you know? Yeah. Well, when did the idea of a novelization come about? Excuse me. It's getting late over here. You guys, you guys are still in the <laughs> afternoon. hour. <laughs> When did when did the when did the idea of a novelization of the screenplay for the original film come about? Was that your idea, George? Was that? I'm no, I cannot. I would love to take credit for it. <laughs> I think I would no. say that um, this was kind of spearheaded by um, Anthony Massey from uh, Massey Media, also Stop the Killer Games. Uh, now. And his company kind of spearheaded and had this idea of doing a novelization for this title because one never existed, you know, somehow, you know, despite the fan being a fan favorite, it escaped being novelized back in the eighties. And Uh, if I, if I might add something to that, Armando, uh, Anthony, uh, approached, Greg Dunning, who is the son of John Dunning and is now the owner of uh, of Cinepix and the and and part of the Cinepix catalog that is not owned by Lionsgate, uh, to uh, create a board game based on My Bloody Valentine. 
so there'll be a board. I don't know if you know this, but there's a board game coming out um, that fans could look at stopthekiller.com and look at the board game. And um, in um, it's um, it's officially um, endorsed by myself and, and, and the cast and the producers of, of Bloody Valentine. And Anthony knew Armando very well. And, um, and Anthony, with the success of the board game and the pre-sales on the board game and so on, Anthony approached uh, Greg Dunning and Susan Curran, who represents um, Greg Dunning in, in, in marketing and merchandising and all of these things, with the idea of a novel and the fact that Armando is a great writer and we should take advantage of the fact that he's free and, uh, <laughs> and, and we should, we should try and think about doing a, uh, a novelization. And I said, what a great idea. And then I met Armando and I know it's a great idea. Very cool. I'll back to you, Armando. I'm here to back <laughs> well, 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 Armando, I, I'm I get assume myself you... a drink while you guys are talking. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, I, as a fan of the film, Armando, I imagine okay. you jumped at the opportunity to to do the novelization when you got your hands on the script, um, and you're flipping through it, and you're seeing like these, you know, parts of the script that didn't even make it into the the movie. I imagine you had to be like, oh man, this you know, a kid in a candy store. Yeah, the script is fascinating, and it's its own story. It's not an easy script to get hold of. It's not as widely available as a lot of other screenplays of mm -hmm. our favorite films, which you can just go, you know, get at a click. Uh, My Bloody Valentine was a little tougher to get an actual shooting script to go off of. And I believe we can thank um, one of the cast members <laughs> uh, for being able to get this uh, Rob Klein for being able to get us a shooting script Stein uh, for to work off of. But so I had that to go through and it, honestly, it was a treasure trove of so far as there was so much trimmed to, uh, entire scenes or just partial scenes. And I started counting and I stopped counting after a couple dozen because it was just pretty constant. Like there was so much more material, connective tissue to the story that we didn't get to see in the film. And so, you know, again, as a super fan to see what else was there was, was fascinating and it, I think it was useful too in that a novel can be a lot more than a screenplay. You can add a lot more. You can build the world more. Um, and not every novelization is successful in that aim. Uh, plenty of those 80s novelizations are very bare bones. They barely have more pages than an actual screenplay. You know, it's just, you're re just you're looking just at a rewrite of a screenplay. Mm -hmm. And I definitely wanted to make this a novel. And, but this expanded screenplay gave so much more material to chew on and to play with. And, you know, I think the joy for me was realizing we get to spend so much more time with these characters that we love. And we really get to explore them and tell the story through their eyes. You know, it's not just a, a third person novel. You know, the whole story I think is most interesting to tell through the character's viewpoint. And so we're constantly getting to experience it in their head. And as their experience, all of the characters get their moments and we get to really get to know them. And that's, you know, part of the joy of it. Um, Howard and Mabel were, and Happy were especially exciting to work with. But also, you know, your main triangle and, and Sarah had so much more 
to work with. And that was exciting. That was, you know, as an author, really exciting to work with. And, you know, I can give you a couple ideas of just expansions that, that I think is really exciting to discover. Um, one famous scene would be the reunion or kind of the apology on the bluffs between TJ and Sarah. Mm. And in the film, he finally apologizes to her and they have a very romantic kiss against the sunset. And the sequence ends as this very romantic Sunrise. reunion. <laughs> What's that? Sunrise. Oh, he that's when it was dawn. filmed? He shot it at dawn <laughs> pretending it's sunset. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Second unit. It's a beautiful, beautiful sunrise. But uh, the scene goes much longer in the screenplay, and it does not end with them reunited. It turns into a fight, and Sarah has a lot more um, independence, and she's a lot more challenging, and she's not so easy to accept a simple apology. And so the scene goes in a totally different direction and she ends up walking back to town and then she doesn't get back until the nighttime and she takes a shortcut through the cemetery and then the miner is there and starts stalking her. Like, you know, this is quite a different direction, but yeah. it's right there in the script. And it was, that's wonderful. Like, you know, so scenes don't necessarily end where or begin where you might expect them to, but we're filling in all that connective tissue that we missed before. And it makes it more exciting. It makes it somewhat unpredictable. It gives us a lot more golden moments to spend with these people that we love. You know, we see them as friends, all of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I did work off the screenplay, but really uh, so much of this was informed by my discussions with George really just talking about the town and the world and the time of and the history of where it's set and when it is set and what the realities of the town are. You know, we were getting into, you know, the interesting character stuff. And that's what you kind of need to fill out a novel. And so it really is an aim to give George's expanded vision of what this could be, what this town is, what the story is, you know, so I had wonderful stuff to work off of and it gives it the ability to fill it out, flesh it out more, give us more to savor in that world. We get to spend more time there, uh, you know, and that's a wonderful, I think, opportunity for, for super fans. Mm -hmm. Now, I also think, you know, also there will be people who pick up the book who've never seen the film. Inevitably, a book will be its own thing. And so the book has to also work as an engrossing and an eff effective murder mystery. Mm -hmm. You can't assume that everybody who's picking up this book knows who the killer is. And so the book has to very work as a serious mystery on its own, you know, for those new readers. So are you, are you taking any artistic liberties to that are not within the script to maybe fill in some blanks or to there are opportunities to bring new things but things that are very much organic to to what the story is and it gives us a chance to be bloodier this will be the bloodiest incarnation of my bloody valentine i think by far and I you know and I can, exp like, to just give you a preview of that. Um, in the film, we only see the death of one of the supervisors in 1961 by Harry Warden. Mm -hmm. He killed a couple supervisors. We get to see, you know, we get to witness another pickaxe murder there. Or, you know, George's original idea on this wasn't five miners dying in the cave-in and being consumed, it was 20, oh, wow. which makes it a much bigger tragedy. But it mm. also makes that crime scene much more horrendous. Mm. And then there is some, there is some more violence. And um, I talked to George about like some of it, like 
was this actually filmed? And he told me there is. And there, there's some very graphic surprises in store that I don't want to even hint and reveal at this point. There's going to be some wonderful, bloody um, surprises and scares. Like I hope to that this genuinely surprises and scares readers, even the ones who are very familiar with it. And there will be new uh, or shocks that you are not you haven't seen before. On and even more exciting, because George has explained to me where he sees um, the story going in the future, and I think it's absolutely fascinating and exciting and thrilling. You know, my hope is that there will be enough renewed interest, say through the novel and through the um, My Bloody Valentine, the game, to really get fans to demand you know, to see where George's vision of this might go, mm -hmm. to see if that story can come out in the future and worked within this novel are the seeds and threads that are essential to where he wants to take it. Mm -hmm. And so astute readers will pick certain things up that you, you that oh. will give you a a clue of where this could go in the future. And so this very much does help set up the next one that George has, which is incredibly thrilling and wonderful. And again, I total tight lipped on that. Like there should be no, no preview whatsoever, but again, the seeds and the clues are there within this um, novelization. And so, you know, again, we hope that, People want to see this continue and, you know, we'll say, you know, there will be a demand for it that will make this happen in the future. Um, because I think horror fans would be so thrilled to see George's follow up mm -hmm. be presented to us someday. It's just a wonderful, and again, it's a, just a wonderful story and mystery and it's organic and it deals with people we already know and care about it's so it's really wonderful i i think it's um there's a lot where this can go where my bloody valentine can go mm. and so you know we'll see how the novelization and and the new game you know how they um excite fans and give them a new way to experience that story that they love so much like the game is really thrilling too. I have to say it's because you it's get to fun. be the characters within the film and there are so many cool pieces to it, including the candy box that the heart comes in and the miner on the game board. You can even turn on his headlamp like through mm -hmm. a magnet. So he's pinpointing the, you know, the victims he's chasing. Like it's, these are just very interesting new ways, I think, for us, for people to um, experience the story, which is, you know, a, it's become such a, its own legend. You know, Harry Warden is a legend that is really fun for people to talk about and experience. And, you know, he's up there with, you know, Jason's legend, you know, in a, in a way. Everybody knows it, like they love it. And we're giving them new ways to experience that, you know, in a book, in a novel, you can just really get lost in a more expanded narrative of it. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. The game gives you that initial, you know, that rush of <laughs> being chased, you know, on a game board. And, you know, these are just thrilling ways where we can get that, um, that flavor, that wonderful, my bloody Valentine flavor. We love so much, but we're getting it in a different, uh, different recipes. It's, it's, it's exciting. I think there's a lot, a great place this can keep going. And I think that fans will, um, I think they want to see that. I think they are demanding this. And I think they really want to see George return and give us this, the follow-up that will deliver and not be cut in the way that his that will not bring immediate regret. You know, luckily yeah. we're in a day where um, 
there wouldn't the censoring of that kind of material is not as much of an issue now. There yeah. is still some there's still some films that get cut and yeah. you know that go to those demands, but it, it's yeah. a lot more free when we can what we can yeah. show now. And to see where George takes it, it's it's exciting. We already love these people and this universe, you know. Let's let's give him the <laughs> the, the keys to take us on another ride, really. You know, so that's what I hope, you know, is coming in the future out of all of this. And I hope the novelization <laughs> is another way to get people excited to um, be with these characters and to, to well, you know, I mean, even if it doesn't, I think, you know, the, the novelization in, um, in Armando's talent and bringing all these people back to life again and, you know, uh, giving them all uh, a spotlight and giving them all even more personality than we've had in the film because there's an opportunity in a novel to give it more backstory to mm -hmm. add more insight into the way they think or the way they feel um you know the novel is beautiful because you can stop time and explain how you feel for 10 minutes and go back to exactly where you re you reacted so, <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly yeah so, yeah you know in so I think already starting with the novel and, and it's been a fabulous collaboration uh, with, with Armando in the sense that, you know, he patiently listened to all the things that I wanted to do with the film, all the things that, that uh, I used as a backstory for the characters so that they have their personalities available to me on screen. And uh, I think, I think it just it will fill a lot of the gaps that obviously a movie, you know, then in those days, you know, you couldn't make a movie much past 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, um, we ended up having to, even though we shot some things, it still had to be cut out because, you know, the convention said 91 minutes. Right. <laughs> um, well, you know, I mean, look, it, 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 was, it was a matter of the exhibitors. You know, if a 90-minute movie meant that they could do four showings in the evening. Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. So is, the, is there a release date yet for the book? The um, first edition of it will go out in, I believe, early February. with Because um, right now it's just avoid, available as a pre-order for the first edition which is also coming through um, Stop the Killer Games. So you can still pre-order um, close till the end of the year, um, this initial first printing. And eventually we'll put this in a paperback, you know, a more available um, paperback edition. But for the, the first printing, it's going to be a very beautiful um, hardcover, large hardcover edition with a beautiful exclusive cover from um, artist Gary Pullen, who's done a lot of mm -hmm. iconic, great retro horror art. And just a lot, he, he's just a great artist in general for him. Um, he, he, he did the dust jacket cover that, because this mm -hmm. will be a hard cover. And, and this hard cover uh, edition, uh, special edition uh, will be, autographed by Armando and myself. Um, and then once, once, and that should be available, I think for, for February 14th, you know, or something in that neighborhood. And then after that, we will have a, uh, a, a soft cover version out that should be available in the, in a bookstore near you, you know, um, We've had several people in the chat ask about why there was no sequel. And um, My Bloody Valentine was not a big box office success at the time, was it? No. No, and one of the I reasons that... obviously was because, you know, um, as, as, as I left Los Angeles the day or two days before the, the, 
the um, the screenings or or the um, the opening. I called it my anemic Valentine, <laughs> and, and you know, and I and I left <laughs> to spend a month in Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> You can guess what I was doing in Jamaica. Well, you know, um, but anyhow, <laughs> you know, um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it's like, look, it's like anything else, you know, I mean, you're selling, you know, you're, you're pretending to sell caviar and then you get people hot dogs. Right. <laughs> um, so obviously the first weekend did very well because, you know, marketing, did great the trailer looked great you know um so people went for the first weekend and then the word of mouth went you know where's the beef you know <laughs> uh, so you know, i've in a strange I've, way uh i think you know if if the you know we didn't want to give away the title my bloody valentine so that's why it was called a secret hmm. right and the secret was the secret of this town called Valentine Bluffs and so on. I, it, it's a weird theory I have, but I think if the movie was called The Secret and it was about Valentine's Bluff and it was the same movie, but, but not called My Bloody Valentine, but it was called The Secret, it probably would have done better box office at that time than My Bloody Valentine. Because My Bloody Valentine brought in a lot of those kinds of people who wanted to see the blood. Right. Right. You know, you can't call it my bloody Valentine and then there'd be no blood. That's exactly so, it. You know? Uh, so I've, yeah. I've pinned the link to where you can pre-order the novelization. There it is. Uh, my bloody Valentine, the novel is, is this, is this the artwork or is that just sort of a, a placeholder artwork? Uh, it's, That's... it's not, it's not complete. Okay. Okay. But there you go. Stop the killer.com. That's where you can go and pre-order the novelization. So there you go. That link is pinned in the chat. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Right on. Right on. Well, I mean, <sighs> If there's any questions for either Armando or uh, or George, you guys post them now. So we've got quite a few people who uh, who are interested in uh, in the novelization. That's always a good thing. And of course, you know, if the novelization is uh, successful enough, if it raises enough awareness. For my bloody Valentine, maybe we'll have a uh, my bloody Valentine too. For all of you who've wanted a sequel all these years, maybe Harry Warden's okay, not really dead. Thank you for it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Harry Warden is still out there. Maybe Axel's still out there. You know, he was maybe. at the end of the, of the original. Yeah, you know, he's, he's just, just a one armed man right now. He's just missing an arm. He could have fit into society. I'm sure. You know, he's still mm -hmm. out there. It won't take much to push him over the edge either. So no, no, he'll be back. He'll be back. unless he's totally reformed. Oh, may, maybe. Hey, you know, maybe that could be the thing. He's reformed, but you know, around the fourteenth, he gets a little nutty, and this year he just gets pushed over the edge. Could he be. dusts off that dusts off that pickaxe, and then he's back. He's back at it. You know, <laughs> uh, Scarlet. Scarlet in Grace is George. Thank you so much for this movie. It's one of my absolute favorite films ever made. So oh, that's so, so I love it. Thank you. Um, and just scrolling back through the chat here to see if there were any questions that we didn't. We kind of covered most of the questions that I'm seeing here in the chat. Um the release date they are thinking is going to be Valentine's Day of next year, which is perfect time. Perfect time. Uh, we, had, we had a couple people mention Paul Kilman in the chat. I actually, um, yeah. I hosted a, um, a community channel 
And several years ago, we did a live commentary for My Bloody Valentine, and Paul Kilman came on. And Paul had said, you know, I, I've not seen this movie in 20 years. And so what was more interesting to me was watching him watch the movie because he was, all of these memories were coming back to him about like, Oh, I remember, you know, I remember that. And my God, you know, it, it was bad. And the, the, the happy who gets the nail gun, that was like a close friend of his who is also passed on. So he was telling us all these memories of, of that gentleman. And it, it, it was just such an interesting I was watching him more than I was watching the movie because he was just like remembering everything. And um, it was, it was a really, really great thing. And of course he's unfortunately passed on now. So yeah. Um, yeah. Well, a lot, a lot of our cast is, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of our cast is getting to that age where, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, health issues start creeping mm. up more and more. You know, Paul, unfortunately, has had health issues for many, many years earlier. Mm -hmm. um, Alfie, you know, mm -hmm. who just passed away two years ago. Um, you know, he um, he was just one, one of the most wonderful people in the world. He was just like Howie, but not stupid. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, but the, you know the nicest guy in the world, always wanting to make every make sure that everyone's happy at all times and so on. You know, um, yeah. Alfie just passed away. Um, there's another cast member whose name I'm not going to mention, but looks like will be passing away soon. Um, um, you know, um, yeah. but you know, a lot of us are still hanging in there and quite hale and healthy. So you know, that's great. That's great. Um, Adam Richards loves the soundtrack. Paul Zaza is great. Uh, how did he get involved? Well, Paul, Paul got involved because one, he's Canadian Two, um, uh, he's already made a couple of films beforehand and he was very efficient and, um, and quick and and very easy to work with um and i knew paul from earlier on and i recommended to john that he look at paul's work when we were choosing the um the composer and john really liked paul too and uh paul and i just hit it off really well and you know i mean Paul created all of that soundtrack. You know, all, all, all those songs in there are all songs Paul created. Mm. You know, all those things on a jukebox, all those country and Western songs, well, they're originals, mm. you know. And, and when we, we looked at the <laughs> ending, and, you know, a lot of movies use, use whatever either the opening title sequence in those days, especially whatever the opening title sequence music was, or they would use, um, you know, whatever the most interesting kill or, or, or theme music was as the, as the end credits. Well, you know, I sort of said to Paul, you know, I think we need something different, you know I mean? You know, especially with this guy running or going, ha 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 ha, ha have Valentine, you know, and so on. I said, you know, we need something to counterbalance that we need something more interesting or different or unexpected. And he came up with the battle of Harry Warren. Hmm. I was telling Armando Two before you, how many days? I'm sorry. Two days. Two days. Wow. I was telling Armando before you, before you hopped on, before we went live, uh, George, that I was listening to the ballad of Harry Warden to get into the mood for tonight. So yeah. I've got the ballad of Harry yeah. Warden still echoing around up here. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a great song. You know, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, again, another bit of trivia. Uh, when Tarantino was shooting Inglorious Bastards and him and, and Eli Roth were 
great buddies hanging out on set all day. Um, they played Harry, the, the Ballad of Harry Warden every day at rap. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't, you can't get better compliments than that. No, no. We've also had several people in the chat ask about um, a 4K release for My Bloody Valentine. Is is that something that you can talk about, George? Is that something that's in the works? Can you? I have no idea, but you know, uh, I'm not. I'm not pretty. I'm not sure that would ever happen. Really, honestly, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I think for one of the reasons is you know. I mean, obviously, 35 millimeter negative can hold 4K, can hold 8K, can hold 16K for that matter. But um, I'm just not sure whether anyone would put out the kind of money it would take to um, transfer all of that into 4K and then transfer all of the, the new remastered stuff up into 4K again. I mean, why not? But at that point, you know, I, th I, think, I think you could safely watch it on 2 2k on your tv set you know with the with the blu-ray and enjoy it you know mm -hmm. instead let's get something new you know we've got uh brazil's watching us tonight so thank you retro right. juniors Colecos. thank you um jason lee ortiz He's 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 digging for some uh, some some secrets here. Can you reveal anything about the extra chapter in the book? Is there an extra chapter in the book? Yes, there's um a special extra. <laughs> I don't want to reveal too much about it this early on, but it's it's going to be a very memorable, bloody chapter. It's mm. um. It's not just going to be useless character stuff. It's um, I think it will be uh, one of those scream out loud moments. I hope. Oh. So it's just uh, we're again we're bringing some good bloody shocks, nice um, to this, and the extra chapter will definitely be aiming in that direction. Um, it's very much, I'll, I'll say this, it's very much about Harry Warden. It's going to be very Harry Warden specific. Um, and we're going to get to spend more time with Harry Warden in this version. So it's, uh, that's, that's exciting. <laughs> he's got more, he's got more killing and scares to deliver that, uh, that we will get in this book. And so, Nice. That's very, that's very cool so to hear. We're not going to just know everything that's going to be happening um, directly. So it's exciting. That's kind of part partly what makes this exciting. And I did take the bloody of the title seriously and the suspense of this. And I'll say this. I had a hard time killing some of these characters because I got to know them even better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they go from... They go from being friends to family, and and then it becomes really difficult to take them out, especially in you know very spectacular ways. And you know the, again, this even you know cut these murders are very memorable and brutal, but in a novel, you know you really get to get the, some some very disturbing details that might have been missed um, in the film. And right. so we we get to, we don't have the MPAA to deal with anymore. We don't no. have anybody <laughs> holding us back no. and we can make this deliver. And that is very much a, you know, a big aim of this, you know, we're gonna give you the bloodiest, my bloody Valentine. And it all feel very organic to, the story we know, you know, nothing is excessive, you know, everything's necessary. And um, we're going to, you know, we get to feel it more in a way by getting more personal 
with these characters. And, you know, it's a, and, and it's a tragic story mm-hmm. that we're in. And I'll say this, this is an interesting, dis- some discussions I've had with George about this um, story. And the movie is, in a way, even with the killer, there's no very bad characters. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, right. um, it really is a tragedy for everybody, what happens in this. And when you get to the reveal, it's really quite sad in a way. You know, this inevitability and what has happened to these people. And you end up kind of, you, you, you sympathize with all of them to a degree, even the killer and how tragic it is, what, what happened to put him in that position. And characters like Newby, you know, he could just be, you know, some ornery cop you know, or sheriff, but there's a lot more to him than that. And, you know, what his insecurities and can he pull this off? Can he pull this investigation and stop this killer or the mayor? You even under kind of understand the mayor who has, you know, a fortune, you know, to hand over to his son, who's totally ungrateful and (laughs) opposes him on every chance and runs away. And, you know, all these people are just thrown together into this, inevitable um, scenario of doom, uh, you know, centered on Valentine's day. And it's very, you know, we get a chance now to really kind of feel it, you know, through all of them experience how that affects everybody. And it it makes us care for them more and it makes the scares and, you know, what happens even more personal. Yeah. So again, that's the, that's kind of the joy of this is really taking it seriously and being like, I think people will be left pretty breathless by the way these um, murders and events unfold. Yeah. And, you know, luckily that's something I have experience into that I kind of brought in and may have been partly responsible for me being selected to, you know, to write this um, novelization before my bloody valentine i've done two theme day holiday slasher novels that Mm. are originals and they're very and they're based around thanksgiving you know i picked a holiday that hasn't been done as much and uh so turkey day and turkey kitchen are the first two of what will be a thanksgiving trilogy an original thanksgiving giving trilogy but uh, you know turkey day is really known for its um epic brutal murder set pieces that are just jaw dropping chapters of like, whoa, you know, like you really want to get, grab the reader and really scare them and shock them and disturb them. So, you know, I get to bring that into my bloody Valentine, which is known for its epic brutal murder scenes of these characters we really love. So, you know, in a way this was like, the kind of thing I think I excel at. <laughs> so they picked the rat man for the yeah, job is what you're saying. And was happy to like get the ability to um, take yeah. these, you know, iconic murders with this legend, you know, Harry mm-hmm. Warden is this legend that we just, we love and we're terrified of him. And so yeah. I hope that um, I've been able to resurrect him in a way and give, we're getting more Harry Warden. We're getting more, of what we want more bloody holiday murders. And it's, yeah. it's a joyful thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's an exciting place to be, you know, here yeah. lost in the Hanager mine, you know, like <laughs> I've been here for many months and um, nowhere else I'd want to be, you know? So, you know, I got to, to live it like these characters and thankfully I got to avoid some of the physical, um, hardships that the crew had (laughs) going down to film this i mean i just it astounds me that you know they weren't building sets you don't know armando but they are planning you to bring you down to the mine right (laughs) (laughs) that's where the release party for the book's going to be is in the the mine right i I think armando you just put a, a, a your finger on something when we were talking about you know the how, why the film has lasted so long and so on. And I think you just put a finger on something that was one of our concerns too. 
there is no supernatural evil incarnate in this movie. There is, yeah, there, there is human beings in human beings all have potential for murder. It just depends on how they feel and the time of day and the circumstance. Right. And, yeah, but and, murders are done with passion. It's a different exactly. kind of passion that the killer is exp yeah. expressing. In, in, in this one, there, there is no strange, supernatural, evil seed in this. It's all, everything comes from our unfortunate circumstances and the revenge for be feeling like you've been, you've been betrayed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just so, the and realities. I, I that... that is one of the key points to go back to what you were saying on why it still resonates so much. Because yeah, you know, it could happen. This is yeah. the only slasher film I know that could act Actually happen. You know, it also helps that I came. I you know, grew Jason up in a small. Mike Myers. Well, you know, I mean, they can be burnt and killed and decapitated, and they'll still come back. <laughs> <laughs> and they have, yeah. yeah. Uh, one and last question. One last question for George, and then we'll call it a night here. Uh, Distorted Visions wants to know: Is there any plans to release Pinball Summer on Blu-ray? Well, you know, that would that would mean that a distributor would want to uh, invest in, in turning into Blu-ray. From what I, I know right now, there's a DVD that's available. Uh, I don't know how many copies are still available or where. I received one about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, so I'm not sure of that. I, I think if there is... Um, I, I had, I seem to remember that somebody, some distributor approached me. The problem is, is that the producer and distributor of, of pinball summer has passed away. So I have no idea right now. And that was a few years ago. So I've no idea right now who actually owns the rights to it. Yeah. You know, but I would love to see it. I'd love to see a Blu-ray okay. of it. Okay. I had a lot of fun making that movie. Now that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> you had a few my bloody Valentine <laughs> cast members in there as well. Yeah. I think. Well, we had quite a few of the cast members. You know, I've been mean, very loyal. It was the same director of photography, the same, you know, a lot of the same cast. Um, you know in a lot of the same crew behind the scenes crew you know on the two films Th those were my first two films and obviously i wanted to work with people i knew trusted and loved i hmm. still do well and i I've have got somebody pinned... new i can work with like that <laughs> <laughs> well, i have pinned the link to order the novelization of my bloody Valentine in the chat. Uh, I've also posted the link a couple of times in the chat. So it's, it's there. I'll also post it in the description for when the stream becomes archived on my channel. Um, but it's stop the killer.com. That's where you go to pre-order the my bloody Valentine. And that's where you get the games too. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Well, I just want to thank both of you for coming on tonight and spending time talking about My Bloody Valentine and the novelization and just everything My Bloody Valentine. This has been a blast. So thank you both very, very much. Thank you for inviting. Thank, thank you very much. Have a great evening, Gilmer. Take right care. Right on, man. Bye -bye. Take care, buddy. Bye. So let me do a couple of shout outs here and then I will call it a night uh thank you nico for the ten dollar super chat very kind of you sir appreciate that uh let's see we've still got sean senior with us christopher robin uh oh armando's hopefully there's no heart in armando, there you're amazing is there a heart in there oh my god oh my god there is a heart oh, oh oh my god armando you're amazing oh my god oh save that for later <laughs> <laughs> absolutely uh, that's a love letter from Harry Warden <laughs> right there. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Flip Searles, thank you for tuning in. Distorted Visions, uh, Saturn Video Tank, uh, Adam Richards, Scarlet in Gray, JT Soul, uh, Dave, Movie Maker, JBT, Rock Music Forever, Tank, Robert Long. Uh, let's see who else was with us tonight here. Had quite a quite a number of people hanging out with us tonight, so that was cool. Michael Sullivan. Uh, Coco, Coco Butter, nice. Ross Jordan, uh, Heath Denson, Joe Reese. Yeah, thank you all for hanging out with us tonight. This has been an absolute blast. And uh, yeah, keep your keep your eyes peeled for the board game for My Bloody Valentine and the novelization for My Bloody Valentine. So thank you all again for tuning in. Thank you, George. Thank you, Armando, again for joining me tonight. It's been a blast. And uh, everybody out there, take care. Oh, um, where can we find you on social media, Armando? On uh, Facebook, Armando Munoz, and uh, Pervula One on Instagram. Okay. George, do you have a social media presence? None, and never will. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> uh, thank you all again for tuning in. Have a great rest of your night, and take care. And until next time, peace. Sure.